Yeah, I also academically studied music at university. So I'm going to probably pick your brain just a little bit about your backgrounds, um, like where you studied, what was your focuses, all that kind of stuff. Right. I'm ready. Right. To, I'll remember as much as I can. I mean, reading was book 1994. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Were you all right. guys alive then? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I appreciate the compliment. Alpha <laughs> <laughs> giant monster made entirely of nulls stomping around mainframe? Andrea, Enzo was trying to be funny. What's a good ad? You can't talk in these things. An Icasa Hedra. I call yeah. it during every day. Sometimes <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> Tribulations, by gnomes. Welcome to episode 43 of Alphanumeric, the world's foremost reboot podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Christopher Siege. I'm Neo Cal. I'm Lady Glitch. And uh, this week on Alphanumeric, we have a special treat for you. We landed an interview with uh, uh, award winning composer Bob Buckley. He did the music for Reboot. Beast Wars, Shadow Raiders, Beast Machines, amongst a whole slew of others. Uh, we sat down and chatted with him for about an hour. It was a real treat to talk to him. Uh, we're not going to waste too much time. We're just going to get right into it. So uh, here's our interview with Bob Buckley. Game over. We are here with uh, award-winning composer Bob Buckley, who our listeners will know as being the musical genius behind the music of Reboot. Beast Wars, Shadow Raiders, and a whole Beast Machines as well, which we're covering right now on our Beast Wars podcast, Too Much Energon, uh, as well as a whole host of other musical projects. Uh, Bob, you've got a very, uh, very, very diverse career. It's it's quite impressive. Um, to get started, like, how did you end up uh, getting to, to work for Mainframe? Reboot was the first show that they did, so that would have been yeah. the first show that you worked on. Yeah, well, you know, it was it was uh, three British guys came over to Vancouver um, because they, uh, you know, back then you could get points for productions if you if you produce something in Canada or if you use Canadian production team, you got different points and so you got uh, money and stuff like that. So I, I think they got they got some grants to to do the to do reboot, um, and the, they set up their offices in the same building where I had my recording studio. So oh, I heard, uh, you know, down the hallway that they were looking for a composer. Um, and I know they were looking in England and they were looking in Los Angeles. They weren't looking in Vancouver at all. Um, but I thought I'd take a crack at it. So um, I, I, I thought um, because the whole world and the whole reboot universe is inside a computer, Mm -hmm. I thought a way to humanize it all was to do a more acoustic score, like an orchestral score that sounded, you know, like a big John Williams movie or something like that. Um, so I, I demoed what became the theme and what became um, Megabyte's theme uh, to them. And they got a whole bunch of other composers from England and LA demoing stuff. And it turned out that all the other composers thought that um, what would be appropriate was an electronic score, like an electronica score with lots of, you know, with no real instruments at all. And mm -hmm. they liked my approach. They liked that I, um, that I, that, that they, I guess they put my music up against some of their footage that they were working on and, uh, and they just liked the way that it fit together. So I got the gig, you know, and it was just being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, quite, um, quite literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, we, we had the, the challenge was that, um, well, and the other, the other thing was that I was moving out of my house at the same time. And uh, at the same time as doing the Commonwealth Games and the first episode of Reboot, I was moving. Uh, and I was going to be without my studio for several days because of moving it. So um, they offered uh, to give me an office space at Reboot because then I think there was only maybe six people on the staff or something like that at the beginning. Wow. Um, so I moved my studio into their offices. Um, and, 
and it stayed there for several years, which is, pr I, I don't know if it's why I got all the rest of the gigs because I just happened to be there. Or <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was great because, you know, the, the, you know, as they were developing the show and working on the show, um, the, the staff grew. I mean, we went from six people to a couple of hundred people in less than a year. Um, oh, wow. So, and it was great being, having, having, being able to have the music there and being able to have the different directors for the different shows come in and hear the music right away and, and make corrections and stuff like that. And quite often I'd make the corrections like right on the spot while they were there. So it didn't require them coming to a different studio or giving notes or any sort of things like that. I'd sort of work on it and get it to where I thought it should be. And then we would work on it together. Um, so, you know, it was, it was um, a very sort of organic way of doing things. The other thing that was happening was that um, because Reboot was the first ever uh, completely CGI production, um, so th they had all sorts of things that they had to do. They, had, they actually, there was a guy named Gibby, Chris Gibbons, who, who developed the um, program that would match the sound of the actors, the words of the actors to the lips of the characters. Oh, interesting. Um, and he was the one that invented that program, right? Right there. Um, and then oh, so, it, so it makes the models, uh, the character models automatically lip sync. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it would have been, you know, almost impossible to do. Um, and, you know, we had a machine room that was, uh, it was huge. I mean, I, you can't even imagine how many machines it took to render the first show. It took six months to do the first show. Um, and, um, you know, now all of that could be done in a laptop, but back then mm -hmm. it, it required, you know, a lot of computer energy. NASA and, computer and room. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I was going through the same thing because it was the early days of being able to use computers for music, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was going through exactly the same thing. I had in my studio back then, I had got probably 25 samplers and synthesizers all plugged into a 64 channel board without board gear and compressors and I mean, all, it was insane. Um, now I can set my studio up in half an hour because it's basically a laptop and a couple of hard drives. Um, back then it would take several days to set the studio up and get it working and make sure, you know, all the lines mm -hmm. were connected because everything's plugged in, right? So all it yeah. takes is for one side of one stereo pair to go out, and, you know, and you're messed up. And the mainframe we pay for roadies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were mixing to eight track um, digital tape. Um, so I would do um, like four, four stereo streams. So like one stream would be, for instance, it might be strings, another stream might be brass and woodwinds, another mm -hmm. stream might be percussion, and then another stream went, might be sort of electronic effects and things like that. So when they were mixing, they had some control over the, um, and also in the stereo image, they had some control over where they mm -hmm. could put things. But this was really early days. I mean, you know, not only were they forging new ground um, with the show, but I was forging new ground with being able, pushing computers as far as they could go at the time and samplers, being able uh -huh. to basically produce an ADP symphony orchestra, which is what, which is what my goal was, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, I find that kind of kind of thing really interesting. Just like the the early days of that kind of technology, the, just like trailblazing, like changing in a way, like changing the industry and changing the way things uh, things in uh, film and music. <laughs> yeah, pioneering yeah. the way things in film and music production uh, are done. Um, so, yeah, because it had been the first time for a, all. It sounds like a lot of <laughs> a lot of things. Yeah, yeah it was. It was, you know, that they they had to develop necessity. They had to develop a lot of things to be able to do that show. Like I say, the first show, I think they had, I think they maybe had six animators for the first show, and uh, it was it was it took a long time to do, to produce that first show. And then the second one was, excuse me, was a little bit quicker. And then we were by the time we actually got rolling towards the end of the first series. Um, we were doing a show every week, which meant I had to produce, you know, yeah. so you have to keep pumping minutes. out more and more stuff. Yeah, 22 minutes of like fully orchestrated music. And they kept changing the shows, right? I mean, each show would be would basically be about a different game. So I couldn't recycle any of the music I, it, mm -hmm. other than Megabyte's yeah. theme. And there was sort of Dot's theme and en Enzo's theme and and that I, there wasn't much recycling I could do of music. It pretty well needed fresh music for every episode. So it was, it was a lot of work. 
but it's also okay. nice that you managed to carry the moat the light motifs especially like yeah. sad enzo music and the oboes and the <laughs> in the double reeds as the cow yeah. and i talk about all the time yeah like you you have that but i can understand having to create brand new material to um reflect what that particular episode is yeah and and sometimes it's quicker to write something from scratch than to try and rework a cue that yeah. was for a specific scene, you know, because when you when you're working with animation, um, mm -hmm. the music has to follow the action almost frame for frame. So um, that was the other thing, the algorithms that I was using to to create the tempo track for the for the music mm -hmm. was changing every other bar. You know, like be be a couple of bars of 120 beats a minute, and then maybe mm -hmm. a couple of bars of 134 beats a minute, just so everything lined up with the pictures and the action. And at the same time, it had to sound like people could actually have played that, you know? That sounds um, like a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of mathematics. <laughs> yes. there, there is a lot of like math There's involved. A... Um, yeah. I think uh, Christopher and I go through uh, Beast Wars like episode by episode. And um, it's kind of amazing that, <laughs> that you managed to, there's a lot of very different music on that show in particular. Um, like the the heavier kind of like metallic sounds when the battles are happening and then kind of like the the tribal like uh wind instrument flute music kind of uh, can, in the uh, peaceful Cal, moments uh, cal has uh nicknamed it uh as we've been doing the podcast uh uh the beast wars peaceful flute music yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you know yeah i mean there was beast wars and beast machines so beast wars was was um uh uh sort of yeah it was sort of a, a it was sort of heading towards beast machines so it, yeah there was some because with beast machines i decided to do exactly the opposite of um of reboot and do a completely electronic score there's no natural sounds in there at all it's all generated from synthesizers and it's yeah it's a and, very uh, very techno score uh yeah. we actually were shocked when we first started watching beast machines uh for the podcast that uh, uh it was you who did the music in both because we're like wow the the music's completely different because like yeah. uh beast wars is very like hard rock like guitar driven absolutely love it um and then beast machines like does kind of a completely like, goes in a completely different direction and is very like late 90s techno and it's it, it's good like it's really catchy it sticks in your head yeah yeah well i i just need to keep from getting bored you know when you're, when you're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, you, when you're scoring like you know two or three hundred shows um it i i just i'm not interested in writing the same music over and over again yeah. when you get onto a series i mean luckily reboot was a successful series and we had a good run and um and so i got to develop themes and uh, and the technology got easier and easier to use i mean i was constantly changing the sounds that i was using and buying new samplers and new and mm -hmm. eventually sample libraries came along which was wonderful because then you actually had I could do a lot of the music straight out of the computer without having to plug in external devices and things like that. So it, yeah, I mean, the technology was constantly changing as we were developing the shows. Yeah, wow, tra uh, tra trailbla yeah trailblazing time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you, you uh, into season two, especially and onward in reboot, I find uh, like the the music just it even in that show just got even more and more diverse like in the season two episode bad bob it's it's a yeah. it's very very rockin theme like uh uh and like that later was, on i love that episode that that was so that was so much fun. i think everyone does oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's one, one of the most best. musically awesome episodes out of all you know four yeah. and a half seasons <laughs> yeah so before reboot i i played in rock and roll bands for 20 years and oh, okay. all over the oh. place and and, and uh, did all that stuff. Had really long hair, um, and <laughs> sometimes I had an afro. Sometimes it was actually dyed purple. Um, so I went through that whole. There's got to be pictures thing, of right? you with the purple afro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Please. <laughs> but the but the guy that I co-wrote with that was in those bands was a guy named David Sinclair, guitar player, absolutely mm -hmm. amazing guitar player. Um, and so he was the guitar player on on Bad Bob, and I basically brought. I had a framework set up with the tempos and um and sort of what were the hit points and things like that and i just brought him in gave him a chord chart and i said just go for it so we put the picture up and he just sat with his guitar and just jammed um and that's what's so magical about it is because it's there's not a lot of um 
forethought went into it. Mm -hmm. It very much is in the moment music, you know. So yeah, I like really that. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it definitely translates quite well to the um, uh, to the screen. And later on in uh, season two of reboot, uh, especially like there was the the the, the Nullzilla episode <laughs> with uh, the the Power Rangers parody, and like uh, the the theme that you came up with for that was like kind of like Power Rangers like esque. Power Rangers, like um, uh, kaiju esque. It's it's one of my favorite uh, pieces of music from Reboot. Yeah, it was it was fun. I mean, you know, sometimes I didn't get all the references. The the guys that did the show were real game nerds, right? I yeah. Mean, oh, yeah. All they did is they played games. When they weren't doing Reboot, they were playing games, and and I wasn't such a game nerd, so I mm -hmm. I didn't quite have the references that they had, but they would you know drag me in and make me listen to whatever the whatever <laughs> it was they were lifting from. I mean, and then there were some shows um, like the one that was based on The Prisoner, which was an English number television. seven, number yeah. seven, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's one of Christina's favorite episodes. Yeah, yeah. It was the first I one I got to guest on. <laughs> yeah, I love the original series, you know, because um, I'm old. Um, but I, I love the original series, and um, and that was really fun working on that, trying to sort of parody the music without sounding exactly the same and capture that mood, you know, of, of that show. Um, and then there was another one where they wanted a the theme. It's it's a really it's an old old soap opera, radio soap opera from from England that was on in the 1950s and 60s called The Archers, and I never okay. heard of it. Um, and, and one oh. of the guys, one of the English guys came in and started singing me this theme because we couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> and, um, and I can even, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba, da, ba, da, da. that was the theme from the archers. I remember him singing and he wanted something like that as if anyone <laughs> would get it, would get that reference that was still alive. Um, but you know, there was lots of things like that in there. There's one scene, there's one scene where they, pan through a, a gravestone quite quickly and you see R.I.P. Bob Buckley. Oh, it's amended event, yes. Right, right, yeah, the yeah. season three opener, They yeah. killed me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I, you know, and that, that scene wasn't rendered till the end, so I only got to see um, um, a, a graphic of it. I never actually saw my gravestone till, till, till the final cut. <laughs> Uh, later yeah. on in season four, you got to do a uh, the the song Firewall, which is on your your website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. uh, uh, to to me, it seems like it's uh, it's an homage to the theme to um, uh, Goldfinger, perhaps. It's, it's sort of yeah, it's sort James of all, Bond -esque. all the early all the early James Bond themes rolled into one. Uh, yeah, that was really a lot of fun, and I got to hire some live musicians for that because it was too difficult to try and do that with samples. So I brought in, um, I brought in a couple of French horn players and a couple of trumpet mm -hmm. players to do that. And I uh, think the live brass for that just really made it pop. And yeah. that's something that like electronics and synths just could not replicate. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was really fun. That that whole episode was a lot of fun. The opening of it too, because um, because I love the original music to James Bond. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much the latest movie. Um, but um, <laughs> Haven't seen it yet. Yeah, <laughs> it's Hans Zimmer, and you know, it's he's sort of writing non-music these days. It's it's just mm -hmm. sort of music that uh, I shouldn't say this on a webcast, but it's sort of music <laughs> that 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 fits in and sort of serves its purpose. But you couldn't you couldn't walk away humming any of the themes, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, like the early James Bond movies. The themes were just all over the place, and they, they became very iconic for the series. <clears throat> it's interesting that you. Uh, kind of mention oh well you know you don't have the music in a lot of movies now in your head it kind of feels like music is uh like a mood setter and instead of an accompaniment to a lot of yeah. scenes in movies now it, especially it, action scenes yeah uh, it's, all, it's almost like melodies have become a dirty word having a melody <laughs> yeah um but i have a theory <laughs> Um, okay. And this gets technical, but, but with sample libraries, um, like acoustic sample, orchestral sample libraries, mm -hmm. there are certain things that they do really, really well. Um, they don't do brass, like like really big brass thing all that well. Um, they're pretty good at woodwinds. They're pretty good at strings. They're very good at doing percussion because percussion is just a single hit, easy to sample. Yeah. But the, the one thing that they, they do really well is 
like strings like chunk 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 that yeah. stuff that yeah. kind of string stuff is really really easy to sample sounds really effective gives this scene a lot of energy um but there's no melody involved in that it's just rhythmic um so i i think that the, the because you know i know Hans Zimmer and guys like that are 90 percent of what you hear is sample libraries they're not real players um and I, I think what's happening is that they're just doing things that that you can do easily and effectively on a sample library. That if you had written it for actual instruments, you might have written something different. Um, anyway, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback with that theory too because movies themselves um, have fundamentally changed over. Um, well, they they always do, but uh, oh yeah yeah, Evol action very scenes, evolving medium. The, the, the cuts. Like something that action scenes and James Bond does this exceptionally well is it, it cuts the video different camera angles like every three seconds. There's not just any sitting shots of people talking or uh, the the single shot action cam is coming back, <laughs> thankfully. And I think maybe because of how the videos are being edited now, the music is like trying to match. And as a result, it's there's no room for melody there because well, yeah, the shots I, move so quickly. I don't know what I'm trying to sputter out here, but. No, no, I know what you mean. I mean, it's, it's true that there, there are some times where melody just gets in the way uh, and you don't want it there at all because, but there are other points, um, especially big expansive scenes and stuff like that. Or if you've got a complicated story with a lot of characters, sometimes the music can help um, indicate where you are in the story and indicate the character in a subtle way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, to move on uh, to, to Beast Wars a little bit. Um, in Beast Wars, you definitely, you can tell where we're transitioning to, like even, like even if you had your eyes closed, you can tell whether we're transitioning to the maximal bass because we get, as Cal calls it, the peaceful flute music. <laughs> Or if we're transitioning to the Predacon bass, we get like a more like uh, like rock driven music. Um, so that plays into exactly what you were just saying. Yeah. No, music uh, can be useful for um, uh, for that, for setting the atmosphere and setting the tone and stuff like that. Um, in action scenes, it's a whole different thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, quite often action scenes are heavily driven by sound effects. Mm -hmm. So you don't want the music to get in the way because it's going to get turned down anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah makes sense uh so uh uh on the subject of beast war so what uh, uh you mentioned like what what kind of like the, the the mandate was or what you uh, like what your inspiration was going into composing the music for reboot uh what what was your thought process going into beast the music for beast wars specifically beast wars well yeah it was um yeah, I, I, it was ex exactly what you just described. It was, it was sort of acoustic-based flute, sort of jungle-type music, for the, for the, um, for, for the one team of people, and then for the, for the, the yeah, for the, <laughs> the and, and then, yeah, sorry, I, um, and then more electronic for for the others because they, they and and then that became sort of more what what Beast Machines became. But it was it was just to set the tone, uh, and I think one of the first scenes is them discovering the um, indigenous people uh, where they where they were on the planet that they were right. Um, yeah, so they're that, like proto humans. Yeah, yeah, on the exactly. Show. Um, so that was part of it too. It was like giving giving that world uh, a sort of a more of a I don't know something that sounded more ancient or primal ancient and like organic in yeah. contrast to the robots that are yeah. landing on the the show uh yeah yeah it's interesting that you mentioned that like organic or ancient sound because that's completely gone when you move on to beast machines yeah yeah um where there's no there's no trees there's no jungle music it's robots and cyberpunk and it, it's that the, the wacky world of of beast machines is very yeah. different uh christopher that, Siege, did that you was have... really that was i mean i really enjoyed that that series just because for me it was different than anything i'd ever done before um but it was i was surprised that you did you moved on from uh yeah. 
reboot to Beast Wars, and then it was like, what? Bob Huckley did Beast Machines too? This is <laughs> this is wild. I love the music on that show. Yeah, but and the challenge was to um, when you're sticking to com- uh, completely electronic score and a very edgy sounding score. Mm-hmm. The thing was, how do you create? Um, how do you create softer moments? How do you create moments where where you know where where there's emotion going on between the characters with that music? Um, <laughs> right. So that, that, <laughs> um, so that that was the thing. Uh, but you know, I I, I thought it you know, I thought it worked well. I, I was sad that that series didn't go on a little longer because I, I thought we could have um, done some some really cool things if we had, if it had gone on for another couple of seasons, but unfortunately it didn't. Yeah, it's a very, um, uh, I, I had never, I watched, like I watched Reboot and Beast Wars growing up, but I had never, uh, and same with Cal, like we had never really watched Beast Machines, but we've been going through it uh, on our Beast Wars podcast and uh, we both become huge fans of the show. Uh, it's, uh, Be- Beast Machines is great. It's a very, very, very underrated series in my opinion. Uh, and speaking of underrated series, uh, Shadow Raiders, um, I, I mentioned Shadow Raiders, the, the theme song to Shadow Raiders. It's one of my favorite cartoon theme songs. Uh, Hang on, I'm going to leave for one second. I think I have. I'm going to keep talking. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he's getting oh. something Shadow Raiders theme. That's the flute that I used. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that that's incredible. Oh, she's so pretty. Wow. I had, like, I had quite a few of them. So what happened was um, we were, my wife and I were over in Hawaii just before we were about to start that show. Um, we went to see a show there. Um, it was a show, show put on by uh, Sec Soleil. Um, okay. But, yeah. but it was a Hawaiian show. And they had a, a, a guy playing all these flutes, mm-hmm. um, Hawaiian flutes. Um, yeah. So after the show, he came out and he had these flutes with him. He's basically playing them in the lobby for people. He's a really cool guy. So we befriended him and I went over to his house in, um, in, on Maui. And um, so what he does is he goes out into the jungles and cuts bamboo and mm-hmm. he, he can cut exactly the right length. He knows where to put the holes for different scales and stuff like that. And he mm-hmm. makes all these flutes and some of them are, you know, s- several feet long and some of them are just little tiny things. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just gave me a whole bunch of them. Uh, he gave me like wow. 10 of them, all <laughs> wow, different yeah. keys and all different lengths and stuff like that. Um, and that's what I, that was, and I came back from there and I was working on the theme and I thought, well, I've got these flutes. Now I'm going to do something, something with the flutes. So that's what I used for that theme. And, and the, that theme wouldn't have been like that if I hadn't been in Hawaii and hadn't met that guy. So Wow. Look at in the inside scoop. That, that's cool. It's very unique, too, because, I mean, how many, you know, composers would go out and just randomly come back with Hawaiian bamboo flutes <laughs> yeah. to use for their productions? Well, you know, the the thing is, um, after doing, I don't know, what was it, four, four series that were all basically uh, computer-based, mm-hmm. um, I really wanted to use some um, acoustic instruments, like, uh, and, you know, I play a, a bunch of instruments, a mm-hmm. bunch of woodwind mm-hmm. instruments. Um, so, um in that series, I, I did start using, I, I did start to set a microphone up and I sort of play along and and try and give it um, a bit more of a, a human feel uh, for that series, yeah. So you yeah, mentioned you play, you play woodwinds. Uh, did you major on a woodwind when you went to the university or what was your main focus instrumentally? Um, my When I went to university, my main focus was uh, composition. Okay. Um, but uh, I went to university in Seattle, uh, the University of Washington. Oh, wonderful. Uh, but I did play in the orchestra there. And I played, because yeah. I, I played classical music. I also play a lot of jazz. And I played saxophone in the, in the jazz quartet. And I had my own uh, jazz uh, quartet while I was down there as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I was playing a lot, but I wasn't, uh, that wasn't mm-hmm. my major. My major was, um, it was in composition. Oh, um, and it was great because what we had um, uh, every Friday of every of mm-hmm. every week, uh, we would have a different group come in to play our compositions. And so one Friday would be like a, a woodwind quintet. Another Friday might be a brass quintet. And another one, it might be a string quartet. And then the last Friday of every month, we had a full symphony orchestra that we could write for. Oh, that's so awesome. I, just, I, I, <laughs> I shouldn't say this 
out loud, but I didn't attend any classes in university at all. I spent okay. my whole time writing music um, so that every Friday I'd have something ready and I could hear it played. For me, uh, the value of being there in that mm -hmm. institution was the uh, being able to go to the score library and be able to study all the orchestral scores with recordings mm -hmm. and having musicians, really good musicians, be able to play what I was writing. So, I mean, for me, my education was was much more about writing stuff and hearing it played than it was going being going a part classes. of yeah, yeah, yeah. being yeah. a part of it all. Yeah, There's and you so were much, just there to have have those people at your disposal. I was there to, like, to, to use to, yeah to use the the facilities basically. Yeah, this so, is so much more uh, practical education as opposed to academic. There were quite a few people when I went to university that did the exact same thing. They're like, we're not in it for like. The academic classes that we have to take because they often skip those but they you can see them every day in ensembles um i majored on saxophone performance in undergrad and that picked up percussion when i got to grad school so right there with you yeah 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 well you know and, it, and it's great the the um the thing in universities is you've got students in there that are doing their masters and doctors on performance so you've got some mm -hmm. really good players um, where you, it would be, I mean, for me to go out and, and approach the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra and say, hey, can you play one of my pieces so I can hear it? Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's, you know, um, they've got, they're just too busy and, and it, it would too, be too expensive. So um, university is the place to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely, especially when That's you're working with point. undergrads that need that experience. Like yeah. you got your intro, you got your arranging classes, you're making simple little melodies for, you know, three or four different instruments. And it's like, hey, go play this. Let's see how it sounds. What do I need to yeah. fix? And just rinse and repeat. Yeah, instant feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was unaware that, um, that your studio was like with mainframe. And that makes so much sense because so many uh, shows, oh, man, they... Those really stand out, <laughs> um, the computer animated shows for uh, mainframe studios, but the music too. And now that you like mentioned, hey, you had that live feedback that you could go like back and forth and, oh, well, how about this? And it, it makes so much sense that that kind of like fell together because like you said, when you're in person and you're doing it live and you can change things as you're going, it's way different than if you were like down in, uh, LA and there needs to be a back and forth and there are time yeah. delays and maybe they don't get back to you until days later. It's, I, I think you can definitely see that in, in the work. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so much easier because you know, you can, I can correct something or change something, you know, it, right where they're sitting while they're sitting there yeah. and, and, um, and we can get it the way, the way, the way that we want it, both want it to be. Um, whereas if you're doing a back and forth, it, it's never that. It's it's no. because you're trying to describe music in words, which is you know very difficult. I mean, I had I was working on one project. Good point. I had the director. <laughs> yeah. I, I was doing I was doing a playback for him, and this was a long distance uh, playback. And I was doing the playback for him, and he said, you know, I want that scene to be more orange. And I'm trying to figure out what he means. And, and it, there's a lot of that, you know, when you, you have people trying to describe what they want to hear, but the only terms of reference they have are words that, like orange, or I want it to be more edgy. So what does that exactly mean? Because when I hear edgy, I hear, I hear guitars turned up to 10, but that's <laughs> not necessarily what they mean, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's very difficult when you're dealing with language and trying to transpose uh, for a composer to try and figure out exactly what it is they mean. And you can go back and forth a whole bunch of times um, before you before you get it right. But if they're sitting right there and you're going, well, how about this? You're going, how yeah. about this radio yeah. play? And then he yeah. hums it yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like especially... you think Go ahead, Christopher. Oh, I was just uh, going to comment. It's especially got to be hard to like uh, trying to have those conversations with people who themselves aren't musicians or composers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, yeah, I like everybody, the orange. Everybody's everybody thinks they're a composer uh, when <laughs> when they're when they're directing music, and and you know, so you have to sort of go along with that too. And some yeah, of I them think... are. Some of them are musicians. Some of the directors. We had some very good directors mm -hmm. on those shows. Really. Good I gotta movies. know what Orange was. Did you ever find that out, or is it like a mystery lost in time? It was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, hey, I think uh, what, what like, is it? A something wrapped in a conundrum. What is that saying? <laughs> An enigma know. wrapped in a That's it. mystery yeah. wrapped in a conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's funny how people try to put very vague words into what they're trying to say what, and have it associated with musical terminology. Like you think edgy means, you know, guitars turn up to 10. I perceive it as a lot of just dissonance and yeah. clashy chords and things that make you cringe. Yeah, yeah. So. And it could be that too. It could be any one of those things. It's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it all is, subjective, you know, right? Just, mm -hmm. Music is completely absolute. Like, instrumental music is completely abstract. I mean, there's no way really to describe it in words. I mean, you can sort of mm -hmm. come close. You can you can say what emotion it makes you feel when you listen to a, a piece of music, you may feel an emotion, but everybody that's listening to it may have a different emotion. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very abstract. And, and that's what I think makes it so useful um, to, to have musical scores and shows is that you can create sort of this abstract soundtrack um, that that um, that come, sometimes can be right along with the story and support the story, and sometimes it can be in opposition to the story, mm -hmm. um, and it can be equally effective. I mean, I've done, I've um, I've um, scored fight scenes, for instance, with very up tempo percussive music for for the fight scene, but I've also scored them with with just a choir uh, singing singing chords you know a very slow in the background and it does a whole other thing the fight scene takes on a whole sort of sinisterness to it when in the background you don't have all this chicka, 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 all that stuff but something just very ethereal and dark in the background like that something sort of bad signals is going that something to really nasty is going to happen yeah. you know um so it you know it can work in, on a whole a bunch of different ways music music can um do a, a lot of interesting things um and and one of the things that's fun to do, and I've done it with directors before, is you'll I'll do a scene and I'll 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 score it, and then I'll play a couple of other different, completely different kinds of music against that scene, and you can see how the actual scene changes depending on what you've got, you know, what what you've got in the background as far as music's concerned. Mm -hmm. So it can have a huge impact um, on a very subtle level sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big believer that uh, uh, music uh, tells music tells a story, and it tells a story uh, uh, often, like to me anyway. Like oftentimes, it'll tell a story, its own story, completely independent of what it's accompanying. Like if it has lyrics, like the music itself will tell me a different story than the the lyrics that I'm hearing, or even sometimes like if it's accompanying a show, uh, what I'm seeing on screen, it's, it tells music always tells me like a, it, its own story. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. um, and music I, music uh, is universal communication. So even when you're not watching it on a screen, you can still hear that melody, hear those earworms and it takes you back to what you've seen, but you don't need that visual. Yeah. 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 And I will uh, say that uh, as someone who grew up uh, watching all of those shows, uh, they wouldn't have been the same without your music. Your music's very iconic in those shows. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, it, you know, it's a huge chunk out of my life <laughs> doing those shows. <laughs> you know, it was like 14, 18 hour days because it was what, me, one person um, mm -hmm. trying to keep up with 200 animators. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, um, I didn't have for, for about five years, it was like on, I, I was never off. I was never not doing that, um, except for a little break to Hawaii where I bought some food. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was about it. It was, um, it was very, and luckily I have a wife that understands, uh, all, understands me being a composer because it's not, not fun being married to me at all. Because um, when I'm in the middle of a project, I'm not fun to be around because I'm really immersed in the project. You sort of have to be, you know? Because you have to be able to leave at the end of the day and be able to come back the next day and, and take up where you left off in that same space. The flow. Storyline. Yeah. Just sort of in the zone. It's like, it's like an actor being in character, you know, you sort of, a lot of actors, when they leave the set and come back the next day, they don't leave character all for, for, for the whole time that they're home that night. Mm -hmm. They're poor family, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So actually speaking of composing for our shows, did, the, did composing for the shows that we speak about, did that lead to melodies and themes in your future compositions for say, for example, wind ensembles? Cause you have a very wide repertoire 
of pieces that you've composed for, you know, orchestras, wind ensembles, et cetera, is I was pouring through um, all the stuff that you were doing. And I listened to the piece called Code Breakers. And yeah. that, that reminded me so much of Reboot. Like, did, did what you've done in the past influence you what you compose now in, in the present and in the future? Yeah, I, I think everything affects everything, right? Uh, you, you know, in my rock and roll days, um, that, you know, that came to play in, in the animation and, and the music that I'm writing now. I did do a, a wind ensemble version of the reboot theme, which is sort of cool. I've listened to that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's, it's not just the theme, it's, it, uh, it's, it goes into the megabyte theme and a bunch of other mm -hmm. things too. It's, it's actually, it actually works really well for wind ensemble. It's really hard to play. <laughs> uh, uh, it, uh, can, can we find that on your website? Yeah, it's on the website, yeah. You just go uh, on. Yeah, there. I need to check that out. <laughs> just go under concert music. It's there. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I think there's even. I think you can even watch the music score going by while you're listening to it. Yep, there is a score. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, but to answer your question, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, it's interesting you mentioned Code Breaker because that theme was actually a demo I did for another television series that never came to light. Um, it was for Hot Wheels or something like that. Um, so, so I, I did demo that for, for a show and it never, it never happened. So I took, took basically the essence of that and made it into a wind piece. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, everything informs everything. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, but I love what I'm doing now because, um, I, you know, I got really burned out doing all those television shows. Cause after I left mainframe, I did a bunch of other ones for Nerdcore. Um, and you know, the, the amount of money that was available uh, became less and less and the amount of work became for each show became more and more uh, for uh, for reboot I, i'll i'll say how much i got paid because this is sort of interesting for reboot i got seventy five hundred dollars an episode and and i did all of it right right um, yeah. and i got to keep a portion of the publishing which is which is good because it was a, a show that was shown all over the world so it actually it actually, I got an income from it for, for a few years afterwards. By the time we got to Beast Machines, I was getting $3,000 an episode. So less than oh, half. So it went down. Yep. And uh, less than half for what amounted to more work. And by the time I left Mainframe and got onto the other series with Nerdcore, it was down to $2,500 shows, $2,500 a show. And there were guys around, there were composers around that were doing them for nothing. They would, they would, do, they would score all the shows for nothing on the hopes that there would be a, a publishing back end and that they might get some money uh, from, from performances. Getting uh, paid with exposure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it got, um, huh. I thought that, that what I was being paid for Reboot was reasonable. Um, and I thought that I got a good deal on that. Uh, but towards the end, I was working even harder for the other series and not getting paid as much. And the cost of living was going up and living in mm -hmm. Vancouver never get, you know, it doesn't get any cheaper. It's crazy oh, wow. here. So I just got burned it, out and I thought it's not worth it. I was offered another series and, and I thought, you know, I just another two years of this um, for almost no money. I'm, I'm going to move on and do something else. Oh, absolutely. You have to make that decision. To... Yeah. Plus, I got bored. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, you, after you, you do like yeah. 350 shows or whatever it is, it's sort mm -hmm. of, okay, I've done that. It's time to move on now. Yeah, a lot That's of episodes sure. of yeah. Uh, television. Yeah, I saw you worked on uh, uh, Stormhawks as well, which yeah. was, was after my time, but uh, I, I knew about it because uh, 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 an ex-partner of mine knew the one of the creators of the show. Um, so the, the name stuck out to me. Um, I won't, we won't take up too, too much of your time. Cause we've already gone over time. We're, we're very grateful. Uh, I just got a couple more questions. Uh, one, uh, so this is kind of a broad question, but like, what is your favorite piece of music you did for the main various mainframe shows? Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I quite, I mean, I like the root, the, the reboot theme. I, I thought it was a really good theme. Mm -hmm. I like the theme to, uh, to, uh, to war planets or whatever you call it. It's, it had a couple of different names. It did. I like, yeah. I like the theme <laughs> yeah, to, that, yeah. to that show a lot. Um, there's, uh, there was a cue um, in um, that show uh, where the vizier died. Um, 
right uh, I, yeah oh yeah, yeah the the grand vizier of the fire yeah, planet yeah. yeah yeah that was sort of that was sort of fun i actually i think that that might be on my website um um i i really like the beast machines theme i thought that that was quite for the time was quite innovative you know mm -hmm. it took me quite a while to, to definitely to come up with that one um but and there's various cues you know within reboot that i thought was sort of neat um but geez, I don't know. It's you know, it it sort of has has blurred into uh, into into obscurity for me a, a little bit because I've done so much money, uh, so much more music since. Oh uh, oh, uh, what's it? What's the name? Hexadecimals theme. I really like that yes. one. That was really cool. <laughs> um, no, speaking, actually, speaking of, like that that. Episode, <laughs> speaking of that episode, did you write the the Bob and Megabyte guitar duel? Yes. Okay. Yeah, nice. but, that, but that once again, <laughs> that once again was uh, was improvised, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's better for it. Like it, it sounds like two people just improvising, just ripping, yeah. they're yeah. just going at it. ripping at each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had the amplifier out in the hallway uh, of mainframe because, uh, and I st I set up a microphone um, about maybe. 15 feet away from the amplifier and we had the amplifier turned up as loud as it would possibly go i mean it was screaming and and you could hear it out on the street it was so loud um and and it took a while to do that right because it's it's improvised and it's improvised the picture so you know you sort of do several takes poor mm -hmm. poor people in mainframe i mean they must have hated having me in that building because i was doing all sorts of crazy things out in the hallways there to try and to try and do stuff you know so. never a dull day at mainframe yeah yeah uh, do either of you guys have any other questions? Okay, My what's the, first, dirt? The, the, first, <laughs> the first question I actually had written down was the process. Can you take us through the process of composing for a TV show? But we kind of just led into it just naturally. So yeah. all my questions on that got answered. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I can speak a little bit to it. It's so basically um, what you get um, is before before they start animating is you get a script. And you get a storyboard, which is just pencil drawings. Mm, um, yeah. And then as they start to animate, you'll get chunks of animation that are basically in place in the show with with pencil drawn storyboards as uh, as they replace the pencil stuff with actual animation. So somewhere in there, I have to start writing the music in order to to get the thing done in time. So a lot of time I'm I'm actually scoring two pencil drawings. Um, and as they get the animation and sometimes the timings will change and things like that. So I have to adjust as I go along. Um, but it's a lot of mathematics. It really is a lot of mathematics mm -hmm. being able to find tempos, like, so that you can get from this scene to this scene, get so many bars in, if you want to create some sort of a theme and know how many, what tempo that's going to be And they're fractional tempos. I mean, there, it's not like 120 beats a minute. It'll be 120.57632 to get from this point to this point. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so it's a lot of mathematics and it's a lot of figuring out how you can have a piece of music that sounds fluid and sounds natural, but is still catching all the things in the picture. I mean, that's the thing that takes the time. Um, so it's very much that uh, a lot of mathematics. Um, thank God for computers, because when I was scoring shows before I was doing it on computers, it was it was really crazy. I mean, you had. I had a big thick book like that with all these tables of tempos and and um, and frame counts in them, um, and it was it would take hours just to come up with the tempo map before you even started writing music. Oh, wow. And now it's it's a lot easier with a computer because you can you can do hit points and it'll it'll find the number of bars and find a tempo for you. Um, but that's sort of the process is is. Um, is watching, spotting the show, first of all, with the director saying, where, where are we gonna put music and what, what do we want the music to do? And then I get a rough cut, I score some stuff to the rough cut, get the director in, we'll talk a little bit more about it. And then uh, as the animation starts coming in, I can fine tune what I'm doing um, and hopefully get the music finished in time. I mean, you know, sometimes it's it's like the, the anime, everything goes late, right? There's the deadline for this, the show has, is gonna go on air on this date and it's gonna happen. And then there's the production time. And the last thing to happen is the music and the sound effects. So we, we are waiting and waiting and waiting, hoping that we're gonna get everything in enough time to be able to make the deadline for the show. Um, and sometimes it means being up for several days in a row without any sleep to get it done. And so I've heard, 
I, I've heard that nothing in film is ever on schedule. No. <laughs> like everything's always behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the deadline stays the same. But yeah, but the you, you still get you still got to go live on this date, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still have my my first hard drive that I bought. It's over there. It's a it's it's holding up a bunch of books right now. It, um, <laughs> three gigabytes. It costs me eight hundred and fifty dollars. It's a like a SCSI drive and it still works. I have other, wow. you know, other drives <laughs> that have died years ago. But imagine eight hundred and fifty dollars for three gigabytes, and now you can buy like you know solid state drives now. Solid state I, terabyte for yeah, yeah. I've got you know all my sound libraries are in um, on terabyte like a solid state terabyte drives, so I can travel yeah. anywhere, and you know they're all in little drives like that. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, like cards. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I, I'm a bit of a tech nerd, so a uh, computer nerd. So like, when did you buy that hard drive? So eight hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> for three gigs. It would have been in the in the early nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad, bad. Like three it, it was a drive. It was a drive I used used on reboot for sure. Like and then like they you, had these. That like that's on. a lot of storage even for that time. Yeah. Cause like your average home computer like would have like at that time would have like oh uh, uh, like one hundred and twenty eight megabyte hard drive. Yeah. yeah. Even, I had a friend. Even the samplers there. back then, you know, the samplers back then, they compared to the ones today, they were tiny, you know. Yeah, I had a friend in like night around that same time, um, who was like, "Oh, like, what? Like, why would you ever need a 500 megabyte like hard drive? Like, you never fill that in your whole life, <laughs> no matter how hard you tried." It's like, oh, you 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 paid too much for that. <laughs> yeah, like my uncle that bought his like computer. So times. Times of change. Yeah, I mean, I, I have an, an acute acoustic piano sample library um, that takes up almost a terabyte, just piano. Just the piano. Yeah, but they sample every note on a on a really nice grand piano in a really nice uh, you mm. know, studio. They sample every note um, mm. twenty four times, um, oh. with the pedals up and the pedals down. You can imagine how many samples there are. In yeah, there. yeah, a whole sound, bunch. Yeah, sound, a whole yeah. bunch. <laughs> All right. What, uh, kind, what kind of saxophone do you play? Uh, Yanagasawa. Uh, tenor or alto? Alto. I was cool. listening to your piece, uh, Prestidigitation, with that saxophone solo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, it slaps. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was fun. That was written for a, a saxophone player here in Vancouver. And I'm for, we recorded it, but I, I wasn't allowed to use the recording on my website. So the recording you, that you hear there is actually a um, saxophone player from Alabama. Uh, he, he's... Um, He's a student at Troy University in Alabama. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very good player. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, uh, this is a lame question, I guess, but do you have any questions for us? No, I mean, I love what you're doing. I mean, I love that you were the age that you were when these shows came on and that you're still paying attention to them and listening to them and I can ask questions about them. I, I think it's wonderful. It makes me feel good that there are people in the world who still like those shows. I mean, yeah. they tried relaunching Reboot and I thought it was a disaster. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. So, oh. Um, Every, everyone thinks it's a di disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave up about six episodes in and I think, I, I think I, I made it uh, farther than most people. It was, yeah, yeah. Parts of it were filmed here in Victoria and uh, my friend was working on it. And I did an extra work. Like I, I'm in like one single episode like doing it. And then when it like came out, I remember being like, ooh, this is, <laughs> it's lost so much of, I, oh, I won't even get into it, but it's just a big oof. Well, the original it's, show, you know, the original reboot show, it was because of the guys that were involved, the three English guys, they're very quirky guys. They, uh, really, they had that, they were from very, the north of England, so they've got that sort of northern sense of humor, you know, it's very dry, but it's also very quirky at the same time. So they, they, um, they had that going and, and that there was that humor and that sort of quirkiness in reboot that that it needed those guys to write the scripts and and have it be that. Otherwise it wasn't reboot anymore, you know. No, it wasn't. It's a good point. Yeah. And it, it comes across a lot. Like whenever we're combing through the episodes, because that's what our show is. We do like analysis of a single episode. Uh, or it's like Christopher and I like to joke, like, you know, it's like a two-hour show about a 25 minute 
children's cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we talk about 22 minutes for three hours. <laughs> well, it's good. Uh, I mean, but there's, a, there's so much put to it. Like, it's, you mm -hmm. can just say, oh, yeah, it's a kid's show, but the music, the animation, the, the art references, the pop culture references of the time, the pop culture references of the people writing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. it it goes way back like you said the uh, the episode uh about um oh i've immediately the forgot prisoner. the tv show the prisoner thank you yeah. Yeah. um like before that had come up uh, and christopher had mentioned what it was that episode was based off of uh, i think it was number seven christian yes. yeah number seven yeah um i i had no idea and then yeah. upon like christopher telling me and reading into it and i'm like oh like this is, this, th there's a reason why this episode is so weird, <laughs> because it's it's um, primarily based on like a really really old show. Yeah. No, I I actually have seen The Prisoner. I watched it when I was a teenager, and the reason why I watched it was because the Iron Maiden song, The Prisoner. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Maiden has a song about the prisoner, so and it like samples uh, uh, audio cues from the the show. And so I got curious when I was like about 17 or 18 and I was like, oh, what is the like, what is this from? And so I ended up watching through the show. Yeah, no, it was a good series. The, the, the last episode was a little wacky, but it was good up to there. Mm. You know, yeah. yeah. One day I remember I, I was um, they had done, they had broadcast that series with a stand up comedian that, uh, that does uh, binary jokes where the punchlines <laughs> are yeah. one yeah. or zero. And which I thought was absolutely brilliant. But I but I, I was living in the West End of Vancouver and I went for a walk. And this was the day after that show was broadcast. And I heard a bunch of little kids on the beach doing the doing that routine. Doing, doing the, the bit? Routine. Like the oh the one, binary, one, 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 oh. <laughs> and I thought, this is amazing. You know, it's 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 in the culture that quickly mm -hmm. the kids are the kids are starting to to play with it already, you know. So it was very good. Um, so to, to wrap things up, uh, do you have anything you're, uh, you're working on right now that you, you want to plug, want to hype up? Well, you know, my life now is quite different than, than animation days. I, I, I'm writing a lot of orchestral music now, which is fun. And I just, um, I was just in Quebec city recording my third symphony. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, that's, um, being mixed as we speak. Um, it was interesting because it was, um, the first time that those musicians had been out uh, playing together for almost two years now because yeah. of COVID. And we had to get um, a very large uh, cathedral to put them all in so that they could all be physically distanced. Um, mm -hmm. So you can imagine a big orchestra and the, the percussionists couldn't hear the front line at all. And nobody, I mean, everybody was so separate that it really was the conductor that was just, they had to watch the conductor like a, like a hawk to be able to play together. But you know, the because they were distanced and because they were in such a beautiful space, the acoustics of the recording are just absolutely amazing, um, which wouldn't have happened if, if we had been in a, in a studio. So uh, yeah, it turned out really well. I was really happy with it. Well, yeah, the, some but of the my, best my orchestral I've been music in. sounds my orchestral <laughs> music sounds like my music that I wrote for TV and movies. You know, it's it's yeah. very it's very um it's very cinematic. Uh, all my music is because I you know that's sort of how I hear music is by seeing things. So it's it's all that. I don't write really a sort of obscure stuff. I, my stuff is is quite visual. If you close your eyes when you're listening to my music, you probably will see some sort of a little mini movie score or something like that yeah it it moves mm -hmm. it tells a, a story as to what christopher was yeah mentioning yeah, yeah. uh well for, uh, to our listeners i encourage uh everyone to to go to uh bob's website bob buckley.com dot com, com. Uh, <laughs> and uh he has links to many 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 pieces of work that he's done over the years uh and it's it's a treat uh, go check it out. Uh, I think I think we should wrap things up here. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, for for taking the time to talk to us today. And we we went way over the the time that I quoted you. So thank you for uh, for bearing. Oh, with you're us. welcome. <laughs> uh, it's been a uh, it's been a treat, uh, Bob. Uh, yeah, thanks thanks for being here with us. Yeah, thank thanks you. for taking your time out of your day for us. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah, nice yeah, meeting. Thank you. you, thank you. It was fun. All right, uh, take care. Game over.
uh, once again, I want to uh, express uh, the utmost gratitude to Bob Buckley for for being on the show with us. It was a real treat to 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 talk to him. It was, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's gonna do it for this episode of Alphanumeric. Uh, best way to support the show: Patreon. Go to Patreon.com/LaserComb. L a z o r c o m b. We're starting at the five dollar tier. You get hours every week, uh, bonus preamble audio where we talk about random nonsense before we get into recording the shows proper. Uh, you also get our monthly commentary track, Too Much Commentary. We recently finished up uh, the entire Matrix trilogy, uh, uh, watching and talking over that film. It was a, it was a treat to, to go back and uh, uh, get into the, the, Matrix, uh, the Matrix trilogy, something uh, me and Cal especially have been big fans of for... Uh, well, over two decades now. <laughs> uh, at the ten dollar tier, we you get our weekly news program, Laser Comb Tonight, and uh, you also get to sponsor an episode of a show. Me and Cal, another one of me and Cal's shows, uh, the Laser Comb Podcast, where we comb through random episodes of classic TV shows with a fine tooth laser. Uh, for the ten dollar uh, and up uh, Patreon uh, tier, you get to pick a show for us to review a random episode of. We've uh, we've we've uh, found some real gems so far from our uh, from our Patreon sponsored shows. I'm a, personally a big fan, <laughs> pers personally a big fan of fighting food ons. Which can't we believe how on. good that was. It, it it's real good. I've <laughs> I've gone actually gone back and watched a bunch of it. It's a it's a real treat. Uh, follow us on social blah, 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 social media, <laughs> uh, Facebook Facebook dot com slash lasercomb. Once again, L A Z O R C O M B. It's the central hub for this show and all the various other shows that we do. Uh, Twitter. You can follow me. Well, you can follow the show proper at uh, Alphanumeric Pod. And yeah, you can follow me uh, in particular at Lasercomb once again for the third time. L a z o r c o m b. Cal, you are also on Twitter, yes? Yes, Neo Cal, Neo underscore K a l. And Lady Glitch, you are also on Twitter. Oh yes, I live my life on Twitter, Lady Glitch six one nine. Uh, so go and give us a follow. Uh, this, sh this show is still kind of on a nebulous hiatus, but we're coming back real soon to talk about episode or, uh, the, the episodes of season four of Reboot. That's going to be coming up in early 2021, so keep an eye out for that. We'll be back then. Uh, until then, I've been one of your hosts, Christopher Siege. I'm Neil Cal. I'm Lady Glitch. And uh, until next time... Uh, 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 help me out. Um, live long and die hard. <laughs> well, that was easy enough. <laughs> uh, I'm just a minor. Oh, wait, no, wrong podcast. Um, uh, uh, that's real alphanumeric. We'll go with that. We'll, we'll go with that. And also, <laughs> Uh, uh, this is bad, very bad. Okay, there, I stuck the ladder. There, there, bye you, bye. Go. there you go. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, bye bye, everyone.